Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown, joined by co-host Mia Araujo. Hi, Mia. Uh, Today, we're talking about a pretty hot topic. Uh, I've seen a few articles about this going around, uh, and it's about negotiating fair pay, what to, you know, try to get for yourself as an artist and how to make sure that you're not being exploited by companies who want to not pay you or pay you pennies to be able to make some, you know, artwork that you worked really hard for. So yeah, this is a topic that I think about a lot because when I'm talking to a bunch of artists, uh, especially when they're less experienced or if they've been in like one sector for a while, a lot of people are actually like afraid to negotiate their, uh, their pay or just like, you know, this can go for freelance or in full-time work or in contract work. So it applies across many different spectrums, but I think people kind of find it difficult to ask for more money. Um, and they also consider it like taboo to talk about money. So I wanted to detabooize it. That's not a word. Um, <laughs> talk about it. So yeah, like what's your experience with uh, negotiating? Like, have you like had much experience negotiating uh, your pay with different like clients and companies? Not a lot, you know, um, but I think the the thing that we learned from from like art school is uh, to go after the graphic artist guild. There used to be these handbooks. I, yeah. I don't know if they still make them, but they have a website. And they have a lot of resources on there. Um, but it's basically kind of like a baseline of each industry, how much they tend to charge for each job, um, at least for illustration or like any kind of graphic art. So I don't know if uh, you know video game salaries and stuff would be in there necessarily. I think it's yeah. more just for freelancers, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it mostly is. I don't think it's all inclusive. Um, yeah. Actually, like fun facts, I have the, I'm like looking at it right now. I have the graphic artist manual back nice. from like, I don't know, I'm trying to look at what year this from, probably like 2016, 2015, like a really oh. old, a really old copy. Yours but, is newer than mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still pretty old. And like, yeah. I'm sure the rates have changed since then. Yeah. But like, I've always looked at those manuals and have been like, I feel like this is just like too much for like some things. Mm. And it's, it's really not too much, mm. but like back in 2015, I was still, you know, I think about five years into my career and haven't done like a ton of freelance. So I feel like I was really nervous to quote prices so high because I didn't feel like I was worth it yet yeah. so um like I feel like even though you know everybody tells artists it's like like you know price for what you're worth not everybody's gonna like feel really confident doing that just yet like pricing five thousand dollars for um you know like a project or something like that like they feel like that's so much money like what do I do yeah so um I think like talking about it on a more of a case-by-case basis of like what kinds of projects these are like you know how do you feel about it but also understanding like what goes into it is like probably going to get a better sense of how artists can kind of strategize on pricing their work um so yeah like I'm curious to see like what you're you know like what you've experienced and like we can like talk about like what we both experienced in terms of negotiation Yeah, I mean, I've been really lucky to work for covers for like the top five, you know, publishers, and they will have the biggest budgets uh, for book publishing. So it could be anywhere between like, two to 6,000, you know, I've definitely not gotten anything at the at that high end yet. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I remember thinking, like, wow, that's a lot of money for a piece of art. And again, they don't own the original. So that's incredible thing. It's just to get to art direct you to make the piece. And then, you get to sell the original and uh, usually you have to ask permission if you can sell prints as well. So that's something too in the contract. I like to ask um, to really clarify, can I sell the original? Can I sell prints? Um, And then can I get a copy of the book when it's out? You know, that's, you're always entitled to all those things. Uh, You should be anyway. Um, And if if not, then you should be able to ask for more. Um, But yeah, like the only time I had to negotiate was when I was like contracted for just a cover and then mid project, they asked me to do a wraparound um and I had to make sure we were adding some money to that you know (laughs) yeah definitely because like you know like there's a lot of clients who will like ask for more and more and a lot of artists like don't realize that they can negotiate for that and be like hey I can't do all this work for it's essentially free like if you think about it it's free if they're asking you to do more stuff on top of what you've already gotten paid for that's free work you have to negotiate like another like set payment for that yeah. Cause that's more hours that you're spending. So it makes sense. That's actually good that you brought that up. Cause revisions as well. Erica actually was someone who was telling me yes. that you have to charge for a certain number of revisions. And usually uh, I'll kind of like 
you know, skim through a contract and if it's like, oh, it looks good. But that's the one thing I always miss is the re- number of revisions. Yes, um, yes. Before a, a fee kicks in, you know. Yeah, having revision clauses is really important. And that's something also that I've also worked into my contracts after I had done a good amount of freelance projects. And a lot of them would just balloon and blow up because I didn't negotiate the fact that like revisions would cost more because again, that's extra time that you're spending working on this project. Yeah, You need to get more money for that time. And if you don't have that clause in your contract, it's like so grueling and frustrating because you're just like doing revision after revision. And it feels like there's no stopping point because there's no penalty for these revisions. Like clients will just keep asking uh, if you don't have a clause there. So it's important to like protect yourself and like make sure that you have that clause in that contract because like that can bite you yeah. real hard. And it's bitten me so many times. Like, yeah. so like, I probably like, like one project was like five, six revisions on a certain thing. And I was just like, I needed to be done this project like a week ago. Like, why am I still working on this? Yeah. And um you know, like there's a lot of clients who'd be like, oh, I'll know it when I see it. And like, that's not, that's so unhelpful. Having a revision clause in your contract will r- eliminate the, I know it when I see it thing. It's like, you better tell me now what you want, because I'm not going to be around here doing all these revisions for you because you don't know what you want. Oh yeah, definitely. And that communication is so key because it's like, especially for some of these, like things like covers or advertising, that's an entire committee of people that are making these decisions. Like that round of revisions you talked about could be like, months because yes. it's like you turn it in and it might take two weeks to get feedback from them and times that by five like before you, before mm. you know it that's like months and so that what looked like a really nice paycheck for a month ended up being split across three or four you know so yeah. you have to consider all that as well you know um but I think the difference between something like a book cover or something like game art like you know tabletop games or something like that or even video games those are all such different industries and yep. The interesting thing about all this, about pricing that seems so weird, especially to newer, to younger artists is that you kind of are essentially doing the same work, but because of the outlet of where it will be, it will be priced differently, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I mean, I've done, like I said, on the one hand, done covers for thousands or whatever, but then done stuff for game art that's in the hundreds, you know? And it's not any easier to do that piece because it's less money. It's really hard, but sometimes you're you kind of have to, you don't have to do anything, but I guess it's like sometimes in your head, you sort of justify taking the lower paid jobs because you want to see that name on your, on your resume or your client list and it's worth it, but um, it's, it feels more worth it towards the beginning of your career. Yes, um, definitely towards the beginning. I feel like it's, it's a habit that uh, it can't stay for long because it's not going to be sustainable after a while. Like if you're doing, uh, illustrations for a hundred dollars each like a lot of people will do this for commissions for example commissions aren't necessarily any easier than the big projects but because it's for an individual it's going to be cheaper just by nature of what it is but on the artist there's not really a difference like at all (laughs) there really isn't and so you have to weigh your options like do I want to do 10 commissions for a hundred dollars or do I want to do one illustration for a thousand dollars like you know do the math so it's, you know, you're, it's understanding how to pick and choose your battles, but also knowing that if you are somebody who's trying to get established and get on your feet, then you might have to take the lower paying jobs to start with just to get, you know, your stuff out there. But that by no means means that you need to, you know, allow yourself to be exploited by companies. Like what I always say is like, do not do work for free. Like don't do work for free. Like, unless it is a trade in some kind of way that is beneficial for both parties Um, there are some situations where that will work out and, you know, your favor of like, okay, like I will do the service for you. If you do this art for me, I think that's a good trade. Um, but like, if it's just like some rando who's just like, I can't pay you right now exposure, like (laughs) that's like, though it's the worst, like, and there's so many people who have this misconception that, you know, oh, artists are, you know, they, they love what they do. So I don't have to pay them. Right. Yeah. You have to pay us. Like yeah. we, this is a skilled trade and this takes a lot of years to get right. Oh yes. <laughs> and like when people are nervous about negotiating a higher pay, it's like, you have to think about how much time and effort you spent in honing your craft and getting yourself to the point where you are hireable by other people that takes years and years of effort and practice. And they're not just paying you for that one piece. They are paying for your years of practice and your own personal point of view. Hopefully yeah. there's some companies who like, don't care. Like, yeah. they'll be like, Oh, like, can you draw this like wrestler man? And I'm like, do you see my artwork? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can draw a wrestler man, but like, are you sure me? 
Are you, are you sure this is what you want to do? Okay. But, um, but for the most part, they'll be paying for your expertise and your, you know, your own personal voice. And that is valuable. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And so knowing, you know, knowing what you're actually worth is really important and knowing how much experience like you've, you've racked up uh, is really, uh, is definitely important to know, like, Hey, I don't want to get paid less than minimum wage. Like uh, also like I paid all this money for a degree or I spent all these hours honing my craft, even if I don't have a degree and it all comes out to the same thing. Like you need to be paid for what you're worth. Absolutely. I'm really glad you said that though, because about like how there are certain people, there's, there is the expectation that's like, art is fun for us. Art is easy for us because it's a skill we have, but mm-hmm. even if theoretically your art was easy to make, it does not mean that it should be cheaper, you know? Yes. It, it's yes. It, honestly, it's like, it, I guess, like I think about people on um, who do really low price commissions and stuff and get really upset when they see people who are charging 10 times as much or whatever. Um, there, I see these arguments happening all the time and it's just like, I think that there, there's nothing wrong with valuing your work because in a way, like you're valuing your time. It's not just the art itself. It's like, how much are you willing to pay me to get, to take me away from my project, from Mm -hmm. the thing I want to do? Or even if you're not doing art on your spare time from living my life, you know, it's like, it's an exchange of value, whatever that is. Yeah. And you get to determine that. So it's like, um, we'll talk about this in a future episode, but when it comes to pricing your art as well, it's almost like, obviously your own priorities come into play based on how you price your art. And some people might think you're insane to charge what you charge, but it's, it's basically, you're just setting your priorities for yourself. And if they're not willing to, to match that, then you just don't work with those people, you know? Yep. Exactly. It, 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 like, again, if your priority is to get as much work as possible and to work with as many clients as possible, you're probably going to make different decisions than somebody who doesn't really care about how many clients they work with because they'd rather be doing their own stuff or they have another source of income and this is just a hobby for them. Um, so that's another thing to consider as well. Yeah, I think you brought up a good point too with um, knowing that like this work is taking me away from potential personal work that I could be doing. And I think that's a really important consideration because that's something that I had mistakenly done many, many times where I would take on low paying freelance work that would take a really long time. And then realizing that my personal work was suffering because of it, even though my personal work, the value of that is really, really high for yourself because like that's your name, that's your brand, that's your image. And that could balloon into a project that ends up having some amazing returns, you know, depending on who you are, obviously. But for me, like my personal work had such value and I burned myself out of working on a lot of it because I was just chasing client work over and over again and undervaluing that. So it's like really understanding too. It's just like, okay, is this value going to be worth like sacrificing the time that I have for my own stuff? And so, um, you know, like understanding, like being able to say like, hey, I want to make this much because like I know that I could be doing this right now. So how much are you going to get paid to step away from that? Yeah. I mean, you know, some people don't really have that many personal projects and that's fine. It might be easier for them. They're solely freelance, but for the people who do have endeavors, like that's a big, big part of your consideration of like what you negotiate and what you should consider. Yeah. Um, another thing too, I know um, we're going to talk about this later, but um, the people who are upset about people pricing their work, it's because I feel like they're afraid to price their own work uh, that high and they feel intimidated by that. So, you know, it's something that should be, um, kind of like not ignored because I think that people need to understand, um, you know, the conversation is really important. People need to understand that like everybody is like going to charge different, but the lower end are constantly charging $10 for a piece of art. That's going to create an expectation. So Mm -hmm. don't do this. Don't do this at all. It Um, actually hurts people in the reverse more. more The people that are going to pay $3,000 $3,000 or whatever might also buy cheaper art, but it won't be the other way around, you know? Yeah. Um, and like earlier we touched on a uh, contract negotiation too, which is, I mean, that's like a whole other episode in and of itself, yeah. I think. Yeah. But, um, but it goes hand in hand with negotiating uh, your, your pay because like, again, you have to look out for the things that are going to snowball later, potentially. So it's talking about things like, are you going to get royalties for this project? Are you going to get the rights to your own art? Are you going to be able to sell your own art as a print or an original? Are you going to be able to use it elsewhere? Do they own the full rights of the image? Because all of those things are going to affect the price. If the client gets 100% rights to your art, then you should be getting paid for the amount of rights that that art is going to cost to license. Like 
you are giving up the right to call this thing your own. Like, you know, you should have a clause that you're credited at least. But if they're wanting to own a piece of something that you have done, that should automatically raise the price however much you think that ownership is worth. Um, and I think a lot of people also forget to, to do that too. And I, and I am people, <laughs> it is me, I am people. Um, because I've done that many times where I'm like, oh, like I charge the same for a project where I had the full rights to something versus a project where I had like no rights to my art. And um, you know, like the most I could do is use it in my portfolio, but I can't sell it as a print. I can't do anything else with it. I'm not getting royalties. So you realize how much money you're actually losing. Well, not losing, but just like you could be gaining this amount and you're not doing it. Um, and I feel like, you know, also the reason why it's so easy to exploit artists is because artists feel like they're, they feel guilty about charging for their work or charging what they're worth for their work. And I want to unpack that a little bit too, yeah. of like where that guilt comes from and why we even act, like experience that. Have you experienced that like at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. An artist that doesn't, you know, feel yeah. like, I think especially like if the culture at large doesn't seem to really value art, it's so much easier to feel that way and to, yeah. and especially if you're struggling, because we talked about this a little bit in the, in the evolution episode last time, where it's like the time that your style intersects with what's in demand is so rare and sometimes mm -hmm. does not line up for very long that it's like, I think for a majority or a good portion of your career, you are feeling like maybe your work isn't valuable. So it's very easy to just feel like I have to grab anything. doesn't matter the price, you know, or even the exposure thing that you talked about earlier where um, it's not even just unknown people that offer exposure. It's celebrities, like celebrities yeah. like, oh, and big companies making calls for like, submit your art for this thing. And if we yeah, if you get chosen, contest. you get, you know, all this exposure. And it's like people, I think, uh, again, that are struggling uh, to find value in their work or to value their work are e more easily susceptible to, to fall for things like that, you know, that yeah. um, don't pay or are super low pay. So it's, it's really a challenge, I think. For a yeah. Lot. And I, yeah, definitely. And I see so many young artists, like when they first break into the industry, especially working full-time, that will accept whatever conditions or whatever pay because they're just so excited to be there working on something that is like, you know, oh, my career has started. Like, finally, I can do this. Like, mm -hmm. and they just like step into any kind of price and don't even think to negotiate uh, what they're going to be making because like, they're just so excited. And like, I don't know if anybody else has called it this, but I like to call it the passion tax. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, because like they, people like, on mass also think that if you're passionate about something or if you enjoy your work, it doesn't deserve, like you shouldn't be charging for it. Like, how does that make any sense? It's work. <laughs> but like they do that all the time because like a plumber never gets guilty about charging what they're worth for a job. Like an engineer is not going to be like, oh, like, I don't know if I should charge that. No, they know what they're worth because like it, it like sits in a different caliber uh, at least in this country mm -hmm. of what it like what the value the overall value to society is and mm -hmm. you know I get it like you know like plumbers and engineers and things like that are like very valuable trades but like art is a trade too and art is you know also a luxury so you should pay for that because like you, you know do you need this like you probably do but it's something that like it requires skill to learn years to hone and years off your life also probably mm -hmm. um and like, even though you love it, you still deserve to make a living from it because that's what you've trained for. Yeah. So I feel like that guilty feel that comes from, it's like, what well, I enjoy this. I do this in my own personal time, but very soon, like any artist will realize that the more they do it for not themselves, the less enjoyable it becomes. Yeah. And the passion tax will burn that passion right out of you. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. You'll just be chasing that. And then all of a sudden you're like not enjoying what you do anymore. And it's just like that. I feel like that cost is so high. So That's high. a high cost. So you really got to be careful. Like, obviously, like when you're starting out, you got to, you know, you got to make your money. You got to pay your dues, blah, blah, blah. But like, why even have to pay? Like, why can't we just like start making good money? Like, I just don't <laughs> understand. Like pay your dues. Yeah, like that's what they always say, and oftentimes that it's it's like that because you're less experienced. You need to get you know um, yourself established and known so that people can request you. 
but also just like having standards in the beginning is just such a helpful thing to have. Like, I just, yeah. I can't recommend it enough. Um, and I know that sometimes you're not going to have a choice in, um, you're, you think you don't have a choice in like a job is coming by. It's not paying as much as you hoped, but it's something and it'll get you to be able to pay the bills. Like that's important to be able to do, yeah. but the faster you can get your, you know, your work ethic up and the faster you can understand what you're worth, the better your conditions will become for yourself. And that's just like, I just feel like that's a long and short of it. Yeah, for sure. There's actually something I'm, that made me, that you were talking about that made me think of this. Um, and it's almost like, oh, you were talking about plumbers and engineers and like why those jobs are automatically valued at versus art. And do you think it has something to do with the fact that everyone drew when they were a kid, but you have to go to school and train to be a plumber or to be, an, you know, an electrician or any of these kinds of things that kids just don't do, obviously, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Like, like, I even though you obviously have to train to be a better artist people kind of don't see it that way because they're like a kid can do it you know what I mean like or, mm -hmm. or like my cousin does it but they don't see the effort again because it's fun but also because everyone did it at one point I don't know maybe I'm maybe it's just a coincidence but it's something that came to mind <laughs> no I don't think it's a coincidence I think that's 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 at the core of the issue is that uh it's not really respected because it's thought of as a frivolous childish activity right. um and like you know the same can be said for like games and animation like they're not taken that seriously in society they're, they're taking it they're taken as frivolous kind of like things that you know people just like do for fun yeah but they have no idea like society has no idea of the amount of sheer effort and talent it takes to make you know what these things are like to get yeah. these things out to an audience yeah. um but yeah like I often you know all the time you get family members who are like hey oh, are you still drawing? Are you still doing your drawing? Are you still doing your drawing thing? It's mm -hmm. like, dude, I'm an art director. Like I've cried over this field. I've burned myself out over this field. Oh, like yeah. I have, have had to train and hone and work hard and work 80 hours a week. Like, like I'm not, my, this is, you know, arm yeah. off, you know, pretty much. This is not that. just our drawing thing. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is my, this is our livelihood. This is our career. But yeah, I think it is because like, you know, people always say like, oh, I remember seeing you draw when you were a kid, like you're still doing it. And it's like, they're associating that with me as a, a kid. And it's like, no, like my art has matured and so have I, and I've made it into something that is more than, um, than doodles. But I think that because it's associated with children, it's seen as childish. And I think that's silly because like art is anything but, and people are just not aware of the impact. Yeah. What art has done for our society, like what art has done for the world. Oh, yeah. Especially in the last two years, like we saw those discussions happening about how valuable art is when we are all like in this depressive spiral of just like being in a pandemic. And it's like, what gets yep. you out of there for a few seconds? It's Consuming all these different arts. art forms, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. And, and the fact that it's so mentally taxing for us to create in this kind of environment makes it even more valuable that people can actually create despite all this, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to pay for that. Um, exactly. And that's the thing. I don't know about non-creative professions, like how, uh, you know, mental health kind of crosses over with that. So I'm not trying to say that th that non-creative jobs are not also difficult to do during moments like this, but I'm just saying it's to create something when when things are feeling so destructive, it is like almost like a, a counterintuitive sort of thing, you know, in yeah. a lot of cases. And so, but I think for people who, you know, don't know what it takes to create something, they don't understand that it's actually difficult because it looks so fun or because mm -hmm. it looks so magical, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like people really don't know like the blood, sweat and tears that goes into making, you know, like they're also like talking about like, oh, like the films, like the disrespect, like just at the Oscars from animation, like says it all of like, oh, like I watched this film so many times, like for my children or whatever, but it's just like a team of adults made this who have had like fed their families like on this, you know, from this work, like yeah. this is serious work. And um, yeah, because it's seen as non-serious work, it means that people think that it's okay to undercharge for it or to do it for free. You know, mm -hmm. that's why you get family all the time asking you to do things like, for, like I don't know if, if that's your experience, but it's definitely mine. <laughs> of like, oh, can you do this for us real quick? Like, it'll take you yeah. five minutes. It's no big deal. It's yeah. like, I have to constantly tell everybody, I'm like, listen, like, this is my career. Like, I'm, this is a serious thing that I do here. And, you know, I know I seem like a little Lauren who, you know, used to draw in church or whatever, but like, 
even even if something does take me five minutes, like that five minutes came from almost a lifetime of experience in making this imagery readable, understandable, effective. You know, like if you want me to do a logo, like that concept of a logo takes like the longest, like making the logo is, you know, like that's the fast part, but the concept of it can take like weeks or months. And mm -hmm. like, people don't understand, like they just see a simple image and they're like, oh, easy. I can do that. Like, no, you can't then do it you know no, you can't <laughs> you have no idea what it takes to do that why does your logo suck because you don't know that like there's a whole thing that go there's a whole principle that goes into making them yeah. so you know like people just tend to they only see what's in front of them too um I remember when I was uh I was at home for Christmas and uh teaching my nephew how to do concept art and like what that entailed and I showed uh my mom and sister and him like a video of like an artist process doing it and my mom and sister were just completely taken aback. They were like, it takes this much, like, this looks so hard. I'm like, yep. yeah, that's what it <laughs> looks like. Yeah. Like you just thought it was me doodling on the sketchbook. And like, that's somehow my career. Like, no, like there's a reason, there's a reason why I've been able to sustain myself doing this for years because this, this work is hard yeah. and valuable. And like, people just really, really don't know. And so they continue to undercharge as long as they don't know. So I feel like raising awareness of what it actually takes to be an artist and the fact that this craft does take an immense amount of work and dedication to do um you know we shouldn't be undervalued yeah. like we we deserve to be respected and we deserve to get you know a livable amount of money for what we're doing for people and what we're doing for you know businesses or whoever is hiring us yeah. um so you know it's just like my little my little soapbox there like I think that's a it's a really good point that I think that's the reason why it's undervalued yeah yeah and actually to your point about stuff uh that like how long it takes to concept things that people kind of take for granted that are not creative if you think about all the iconic you know uh characters you think of like from big franchises like Star Wars or like superhero yeah. movies and things like that like artists created those characters and the company kind of gets to reap the benefits because they're yes. just paid a salary for that. But they're not paid for every single time a toy is sold or, you know, oh, a T-shirt sold or anything like that. And so that's the other part. Like, if you were to see the salaries of some of these people that work at these companies, you might think, oh, that's fair. But when you think about how far their design went, it's actually small compared to what they should probably get for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, so, absolutely. Um, and I think that... I see a lot of discussions on Twitter and stuff about pay when people are complaining about pay and it feels like it's taken very much out of context because of course it's a it's a global conversation happening maybe from someone that started it just from a very local level you know it's like so mm -hmm. living in California making this much money might be pennies but to someone on the opposite end of the world that might be like uh, you know enough to retire on or something and so yeah there, all those kinds of discussions as well that kind of cross over I think um, when you're having uh, these kinds of really loose discussions about what art is worth, you know, or what a good fair pay is, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like, there's a lot of things that you need to consider. Like, yeah, what is your cost of living? You know, like, like how much do you have to make in order to feed, um, you know, yourself or your family or to maintain your house? Um, you know, like, what are all the things that you have to do in order to uh, survive? Like, if you're a freelance artist, if you're a full-time artist, you know, et cetera. And, um, you know, that, that conversation of like, the fact that there's companies that make so much money off of the stuff that you're doing for them. Um, a perfect example, I was just reading an article about the woman who did the Gerber baby uh, logo. And it was just like a sketch for a contest. And she was like, oh, I'll finish the sketch later. And they love the sketch so much that they just used that image. And she was paid $300 for that. Oh my God. And that was it. Wow. And it's been used for like nearly a hundred years, I think. Wow. Imagine how much money they've made because of that logo. Mm -hmm. and she got paid three hundred dollars flat again an example of an artist who didn't wasn't aware of negotiation at the time or just you know was doing something for just you know a company and she's like she just thought that oh i'll finish it later and it like became a sensation like that's the face that's what is the first thing that you imagine when you think gerber is that baby yeah. uh so you know like understanding that like how much like benefit somebody's going to get from your work but like it's beneficial for them to devalue it because that gives them the excuse to pay less for art that's really going to go far for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like as a full-time artist in particular, some observations that I've made in, uh, you know, just being between games and animation um, is that certain industries just like 
they just tend to pay more uh, mm -hmm. than others. Like my experience is that games pays way more than animation does, which sucks because it's like, again, millions of people are experiencing the thing that you're making, but you're getting paid like 20 an hour to make it. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough money. No. Like, y'all, that's not enough money. <laughs> like, what are we they're making millions off of you? Yeah. And, you know, like, again, a lot of people want to work in animation and there's not that many options, unfortunately. Um, but like negotiate, like being able to negotiate or know like what a fair wage is worth is the first step in advocating for yourself to know that like, okay, like this is what I have right now, but I want to be able to build myself to be able to make this much for the future because I know I'm worth that much. And so I think the more that people have like talk about that and like share, um, you know, like what they're, what they deserve. I'm never shy about like what I make, like with my friends and I'm never, you know, I always like ask them like, Hey, like, what are they giving you? Cause I want to be able to help them be able to get what they're worth and yeah. get their pay. And oftentimes they're mostly being underpaid. And I'm like, that's not enough. Like you could probably work in this industry and get paid way more. Yeah. And that's it sucks that like you have to, you know, in order to get paid what you're worth, sometimes you have to switch industries or join, you can be, like be able to unionize. Um, and a lot of studios don't have that option yet. Um, but I just feel like it's something that it needs to be addressed and it, it is being addressed actually, like with pandemic and everything, things are shifting and I'm glad they are because it's been a long time coming. Yeah. Um, but there's just so many artists out there still who are just not, they don't know what they're worth and they're not getting paid what they're worth and they're afraid to ask for it. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask. Definitely. The worst they can say is no. Yeah. You brought up a really good point though about the industries that pay more and stuff. And it's just good to, because again, it goes back to the, the thing I was saying that it's like, it's the same amount of work to do an illustration for any of these industries. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, the amount of money that each industry has to pay you is also very different. Mm -hmm. so it's like if you do stuff for film or video games right now, at least in the US, that is some of the highest paying uh, along with advertising are probably yeah. the three highest paying, you know, forms of, uh, you know, pay you can get for, for making art. Um, I feel like there is a, there's an image for some reason that people have that it's a lot of money, but it's actually really low pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's just not a lot of money in books, unfortunately, anymore, you know, the way there, that it was like even 20 years ago, mm -hmm. because look at what it's competing with, you know, like, yeah, like um, we have all this other media now. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, even though covers pay really well, it's the advertising of the book. So it's going to pay the best, but it's like any interior stuff. It's like, I mean, you can't even compare just how much money you get paid for the cover versus the interior stuff. Um, and so it's just examples like that. It's just good to know going in. And I guess the reason why I'm bringing that up is if you are really passionate about working in an industry that just notoriously doesn't pay very well, um, would you Lauren do this like where you would maybe say like maybe I'll shift my style to make it more you know worthwhile for me to to do this for this little pay you know what I mean Making like it easier for you to do I think I, I think that's a really good uh, question understanding how to streamline your work is super important because like you know you're still delivering something quality but yeah. if it takes you half the time to like produce like you know a similar thing or something that somebody hires you for I think that's a great idea to be able to adapt and thrive um comics is a great example because comics pays like trash yeah and it takes so long which is it's it's part of the reason why I didn't become a sequential major when I was at SCAD mm -hmm. was because I knew that like I'm like I'm not going to make any money as a comic artist so I'll just do my own comics but um you know like if you're doing comics and things like that like understanding how to streamline your style so that you don't like destroy yourself trying to make you know an 80 page graphic novel that's paying you like Thirty dollars a page, like yeah. Don't I mean? First off, like that's just terrible. Like, I can't tell people not to do it because I know there's people out there who work in the comic industry and who have worked for that little before. Yeah. But um, it's really just like it takes so much effort for so little, yeah. and you think about how much it costs to make one or how much you can charge for one illustration versus one comic book, and like it can be a thousand for the illustration, mm -hmm. and it can be a thousand for like. 20 pages of a comic like that's yeah there's so much more time in that and so understanding that you can adjust and adapt your style you can find shortcuts you can you know maybe maybe don't do the full shading and lighting and effects and all that stuff maybe your style can look appealing in flat colors or maybe you can make a cute simple style that can work really well that's still enjoyable for you to do um there's a lot of ways to get around it 
Uh, but like it's understanding too that your portfolio and what you put forward is going to be what people are going to expect. So if you have examples of like kind of more your simple work and you can say, hey, um, this is the work that I'm, you know, I'm planning to do for this project, just making sure that's okay. Or like not even making sure that's okay, but like this telling them this is my style. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing that that's what you're getting hired for. Like the level of detail is really important. Same goes for commissions too. Um, I know people like have like different pricing tiers based on if it's ink, if it's color, if it's uh, just a bust or a full body. Um, and so that's like, I, th I think that's a really good practice too. But, um, you know, like if you're an artist, like doing a long-term project, not starting with a super complicated style is really important. And yeah. something that uh, I very recently made the mistake of not doing <laughs> with uh, one of the, uh, the projects that I had worked on. I was like, why did I go full ham on this illustration? Like, why? Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, it's hard mm -hmm. though. It's hard to work smarter when it's like, you know, your default is just to work really hard and just, but um. Work, work smarter not harder seriously yeah, yeah. Uh, because like because also I feel like we feel weird when I think we talked about this before we feel weird when we don't suffer <laughs> yeah. like like for the like for the Shuri cover that I did like I was like I couldn't believe it was out and I just like didn't feel like it was a big deal at first just because I was like it was so easy to do like it just it was so quick and I was like oh like I, I know what I'm doing here like this was cool like you know, four, four thumbnails. And then, you know, there's the final, here's the color pass. Every, every step was approved really easy. There was like one round of revisions that I did and it was done. Wow. And I was like, oh, it's easy. And I was like, oh, but this project was a big deal. That's weird. I was like, why don't I feel like it's a big accomplishment? I'm like, oh, cause I didn't suffer. <laughs> Something that is easy does not have to cost less. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't. And it can still be, it could, you know, like suffering is not again not cute uh and it's okay to charge for projects that, that you're excited again excited about like especially like I think especially if you're not going to suffer like you should you know you should charge more because that's your maybe it's your native style or maybe it plays right into what you do best that's that's how you know you're probably going to give a client the best results like honestly like not suffering so like it's okay to charge for projects that even you feel excited about like charge for it yeah. Again, the worst people can say is no. Maybe you can negotiate with them and go a little down on price if you need to, but also going down on price maybe requires some sacrifices. Yeah. You're like, okay, maybe I can charge a little less, but I can't give you the full, like, you know, spectrum of lighting and shading and blah, 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 you know, and then make sure that's okay with your client. If so, then you can proceed. But there's ways to get around, uh, you know, if a client doesn't have that much money, you're like, okay, then I don't have that much time. Let's see what we can do about this. Yeah. There you go. Let's work with it. There's that grid or whatever it is, that pie chart. It, it's a, it's come up in different forms, but it's like the three qualities, right? It's yep. like, you could either get it cheap, fast, or good quality, right? Yep, <laughs> but you, that's, that's you the, can only get the, two. You can only <laughs> get two. Three. You cannot have all three. Yeah. And so like, which ones is it going to be? And that's up to you for the artist to also, uh, you know, understand what your client is getting, have that, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your head. Is yeah. it cheap? Is it fast or is it high quality? <laughs> yeah, it's like cheap and fast is like the worst option because you're going to get low quality, you know? Oh, for sure. <laughs> but that's what usually people want. <laughs> so, yeah, they do. I mean, they no, they want, they want, they want all three. They want cheap, fast, yeah. and high quality. Like they're just like, okay, but you can't give them all that. Like if it's going to be, if it's going to be cheap, then it's not going to be great quality. Uh, and if it's, you know, like there's just, you have to have the give and take of like what do you, what can you deliver a client who can't pay that much? Like if you want to work for them, then fine. They can't get the works and yeah. you know, that has to be okay. And, and yeah, sorry. yeah, go on. No, no. I was going to say like for somebody who can perform fast and good quality, they deserve to be paid more because that yes. is incredibly hard, you know, to, to make good work quickly, you know? Yes. So it's it, just like, yeah, again, not undervaluing yourself just because you can get it done fast. Yeah. Uh, again, that takes skill to, that takes years to master to be able to speed up your, your art. And so they need to pay for that. Exactly. Um, but I also know just like being, you know, being an artist and, and knowing other artists, it's very hard for a lot of artists to, to parse down on their style and to, um, and to edit themselves for other clients, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause they like feel like, oh, like I want to be able to stand by behind the quality of my work. And I get that. I think that's totally fine. I think that it's also possible to make quality work without having to, you know, spend forever on something that costs a hundred dollars. Yeah. Like 
the, again, like it's understanding and being adaptable, finding your shortcuts and knowing how to make your style work in a simpler, you know, in a simpler way. Uh, there's definitely many things that I have done that um, I've been able to like, not, I don't want to say cut corners, cut corners is not really that. It's more so understanding how to do like the minimum viable product while still making it a good representation of my body of work. Um, and I think it's, and behind that is having a good concept. That's, that's how I compensate for keeping things simple. If the concept shines, if the line art shines, then I don't have to do the full works of color and lighting and shading. So that takes me the longest. And my line, my line art is like what I enjoy the most and it's what is I'm, what I'm fast at. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna emphasize line art over super detailed color. And that is fine because that's how my work is shown. So it's also like, you know, in negotiating and knowing like where you can, you know, uh, kind of edit yourself down. So it's being smart about, again, working smarter and not harder. Yeah, for sure. Lauren, since you've had experience actually working at a studio, have you ever had to negotiate for a higher pay, like being hired, for instance? Oh, yeah. And what advice would you give someone who feels like, oh, I don't feel right doing that? First off, it's a company. Like, to ask for what you deserve. Like, they're, like it's, it's not the person's money who's asking you the question. It is the company's money, unless it's a startup. Um, and it's okay to ask that company for money because, once again, they're probably making millions off of your work. So it's okay to ask. Sometimes they won't be able to pay you what you want, and sometimes they can. But again, you don't know until you ask. I think an important thing to do is look on Glassdoor and look on other websites and comparables to get a sense of the average salary that uh, you're going in for and what you should be making and try to negotiate, I would say, probably 10K higher than that and see what happens. Because usually what will happen is like, we can't pay you this much, but we can pay you this much and you'll land somewhere in the ballpark of what you wanted. Uh, when I first got into the industry in animation, I did not do that because I was fresh out of school and had no idea how to negotiate. But then when I went into the game industry, um, that was what all my friends were telling me to do. They're like, oh, negotiate. Like, you know, this is how much you should be making. And at first I was just like, what? Like I was asking, I was gonna ask for way lower than what the actual price I could have been getting paid was. And then fortunately, um, you know, I read up on some things and then a friend was like, oh yeah, like this person makes this much. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, you can ask for that much. No, no problem. And I was like, okay, I'll see. And I was like sweating bullets when I was sending that email, I was terrified. But what happened was I negotiated 5k over even the price that, you know, they were telling me to do. I was like, okay, 5k over. Uh, and they were like, okay, we can't do that, but we can do this. And I was like, still baffled by the amount of money it was. I was like, how did this just happen? And I was like, okay, that's great. And it worked out. And I did the same for when I went to, um, you know, Zynga. Uh, and I did the same for when I went to Wild Seed. And uh, all like each time, like I was able to have a better understanding of my worth and what, you know, and what my skills were. And knowing that you, like when a company is trying to hire you, they're hiring you because you are an asset to them. And so how much does an asset get paid? How much is that worth? How valuable are they willing to treat you for your skills and expertise? And so for somebody like me, who's now a manager and art director, that's pretty high value. And I feel more comfortable negotiating something, you know, that's like, you know, what, I, again, what I'm worth, because I know that I can lend a certain point of view to this project that maybe nobody else has. So it's totally fine for me to be like, yeah, I want more or, Hey, like, can you give me, you know, a little bit extra or can you give me a bonus or can you give me a stock? Like there's different things to negotiate too. So know that that's, you know, out there and understanding like what you, what your requirements are, what your needs are. Hey, I can't work overtime is even a acceptable thing to negotiate. You can do that. A lot of people don't realize that they can do that, but oftentimes it takes like more time in their career. But if you have restrictions, you should communicate that and be like, Hey, can you work with this? Because I need you to do this for me. Uh, and if they're willing to, you know, put the effort towards you, like for you, then they will do it. But it does not hurt to ask. It usually will not lose you the job. Like I guarantee it. I've never heard of a case where like, oh, I, I asked for too much and now they don't want to hire me. Yeah. It, that almost never happens. So and if it did happen, you probably shouldn't then go and lowball the next company. You should stick to your guns. Like someone exactly. will give it to you. Exactly. Like don't let it discourage you, even if it does happen. But I so far haven't really heard of a case where that happens like even in my like like 15 years of doing freelance 
there was only once where I was like, um, you know, I tried to negotiate a pay and they like turned it down like outright, but that was once out of like how many projects. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and again, I, I was like, I'm not, I don't even need this project. So like, I didn't need, it sounded cool, but it was like five different illustrations for like a thousand dollars. And I'm like, I'm not, no, that's, that's too low. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> and so I was, I was happy that they turned it down. I was like, all right, like, I don't have, we don't have to do this then. Yeah. And that was that. So yeah, like that's my expertise with it. Um, but like nowadays, a lot of what these studios will do, especially like, uh, studios who are close to colleges will use the carousel of young talents to cycle through because young people don't really know how to negotiate for themselves so it's easier to pay them lower yeah. um so beware of that and if you have young friends who are trying to get into the industry um you know i would recommend show them this episode or just like you know give them advice to be like hey you should negotiate your salary because they're going to try to take advantage of you um because yeah. like the ideal world is that no one is taking like that we all have standards for ourselves so that nobody can take advantage of us Definitely. and that's the ideal and even if you're fresh out of school you're you know you're allowed to make money you know yes you are allowed to make money <laughs> don't think that if you're fresh out of college that you you know you take whatever they're going to give you you need to pay you need to pay rent and eat food as much as the next person does it doesn't matter if you're a 10 year veteran or a baby college student you have to live so if a studio is not going to pay you a livable wage, then that's probably not going to work out. Yeah. So, yeah, like I know there's some people who can't be picky, um, but it's still like, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's just great to have an understanding of your value. Mm -hmm. It's empowering to have an understanding of your value. Definitely. And that's where community is important too. It's like, talk to people, like join discords, you know, Facebook groups where there are groups of artists and stuff and ask, like, I think more and more lately, people are more open to sharing how much they make and how mm -hmm. much they've charged before, uh, more so than they were in the past, you know? And I think that's amazing because um, the more we communicate with each other, we give each other as artists, the power instead of the company who wants us to, to just take whatever they, <laughs> that they're offering us, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, don't definitely. be afraid to ask people for advice on what you should charge if you're if you're not sure yeah that's, that's a good recommendation I always recommend being surrounded by artists or people who are ex even more experienced than you because like that you know that goes into a lot of different ways of like getting your skills up there and like leveling you up to be able to uh have better standards for yourself but also just become a better artist in general um that expertise goes a long way and like, I don't want young people to have to learn the same lessons that I did through this kind of force of like will and yeah. burning themselves out and like, you know, entering like really crappy work conditions. Like, I just don't want people to have to do that. So the more people that, um, that we can help the better. And hopefully there's other artists who feel the same way as me. Um, so, you know, we hope that you take this advice and negotiate a better pay for yourself. Um, but yeah, I think that's like, I think that's a good stopping point yeah yeah well then uh thank you everybody for joining us um we're going to lead into another topic talking about how to price your work so that's coming up next but i uh, appreciate you sticking with us in the chat and uh, talking this out uh you can feel free to leave in the comments um you know what your experiences have been with negotiating and what your advice might be or like any questions that you might have too if you have any questions that you feel like we didn't answer uh put it in the uh comments and um and we will respond to it with you know the, to the best of our ability but thank you for joining us and we'll catch you next time bye